Hey, good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm very excited about today uh, because we get to talk to the president and the COO of the largest Black-owned bank. Um, and it is actually one of the locations that's based here in Miami. So we really get to get to the nitty gritty of the money. Um, and I think all small business owners want to know a little bit more about that. So without further ado, let me introduce Terry Williams. Mm, hi, hi, Stephanie. Hi, it's good to be How here. I'm good. Thank I'm you good. so much. Thank you so much. Um, she is the president of the One United um, Black Bank, which is the largest black owned bank in Miami or in the country, actually. So I started with that. Tell me more about who you are, and what you do. Sure. So yes, we are the largest black owned bank. We are focused on closing the racial wealth gap and helping the black community uh, build wealth. Um, we are uh, about 50 years old. <laughs> I have been with the bank for 25 years. Um, in addition to being the president uh, and COO, I'm also the owner uh, of the bank with uh, my husband who also is black. Um, I always say that. Um, we are black owned um, and have always been black owned. Um, we actually began as four community banks here in Miami. We were the old peoples. A lot of people know peoples. Um, I do, I remember that. Yes, yep, yep. <laughs> um, in Boston, we were Boston Bank of Commerce. In LA, we were founders and family. And we combined those four local uh, community banks, black owned community banks into one bank. Mm -hmm. and then changed our name to One United. Um, we also are the first uh, Black-owned digital bank, our mm -hmm. internet bank, um, the first Black-owned interstate bank. And we've grown from, uh, when I came, to about 50 million in assets to 700 million in assets today. So. Nice. Very yeah. nice. So, uh, you know, I, right before you we hopped on, I, I sort of asked you a question I do want to start with. How, how does one start a bank and why mm -hmm. would one start a bank? Uh -huh. This seems like a huge undertaking. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, I, the first thing I think it's important for everyone to know is that uh, people own banks. <laughs> I know that even after, you know, I had been educated at Harvard Business School and worked in banking, I. I really never thought about who owned banks. And, you know, the larger national banks are publicly traded and so you can buy, you know, their stock. Um, but there are 5,500 uh, banks in America mm -hmm. of which only 19 are, are black. Mm -hmm. um, but out of those 5,500, the majority of them are owned um, basically by white families. <laughs> So that's the first thing to uh, for I think it's important for us to understand about about banking. Um, in terms of owning a bank or starting a bank, um, it is a a huge undertaking. Um, today, it would cost probably about fifty million dollars uh, to start a bank, mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is that regulators are really looking for uh, that capital to support. Um, growth and to ensure that the deposits uh, that people put into the bank are secure. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, you know another important thing to understand about banking is that deposits are really uh, the way in which banks fund loans, but mm -hmm. those deposits are your money, <laughs> right. you know, and they are they are uh, FDIC insured up to two hundred fifty thousand, um, but you have the ability to put in that money and to take it out. And mm -hmm. so the FDIC wants to make sure that, that your money is mm -hmm. secure. And so it does require a lot of capital to be, uh, today to start a bank. Now, how do you secure that capital? Is that through partnerships, investments? How, how do you, how would, mm -hmm. if you, someone, someone were interested, why would they come up with $50 million to do mm -hmm. so? Yeah. So, um, the, the way to that the capital has to be obtained is really through investments of, mm -hmm. you know, individuals or organizations. In other words, it can't be a loan. You can't borrow the 50 million to invest in a bank. It actually has to be equity. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, it's, you know, it's, it's become very difficult uh, to start a bank, not impossible. Um, mm -hmm. 
And, you know, it's something that could be worked out with regulators. But um, again, I think, you know, today, because it, and it's not just the security of the deposits, um, there's a huge investment in technology that's needed mm -hmm. um, today. You know, as we all know, you need to have the mobile banking app. You need to mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. uh, the card. You need that. There's, there's, um, you know, many ways in which you have to invest in technology. So it's a combination mm -hmm. of, you know, supporting the loan growth, supporting the deposits, and supporting the technology that does require a huge investment. Um, a lot of times if people are interested in doing something locally, I tell them to also look at credit unions. Mm -hmm. um, credit unions are a lot easier to start. Um, and then maybe at some point look at banking, but it, it, is, it is a very difficult undertaking. So you tapped on something and actually I saw some different numbers. So you, I'm sure yours are closer, which actually were a little alarming. Uh, you talked about there are 1,500 banks out there, only 19 of which are black owned and operated. Um, why is it important for us to have uh, minority and diverse banks? Um, what do minority and diverse banks add to the ecosystem, the financial institution ecosystem, as well as the community that makes it so imperative that we really focus on, on those banks? Mm -hmm. on so first of all, the, the numbers are even more alarming than what you said. It's actually 5,500, 5,500 banks, of which only 19 are Black. So it's even worse. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's really. Um, and it is important to have Black-owned institutions. Um, and, and just also to give some uh, understanding, there are um, uh, Black-owned, uh, Latino, uh, Asian, Native American owned or indigenous uh, owned uh, banks that are called minority depository institutions or MDIs. And there are a total of about 300 of mm -hmm. minority owned institutions. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's really the 300, if you're not looking at just black, about 300, mm -hmm. 350, might be 351 exactly, compared to the 5,500. So it's not just black owned banks that are that are here to support our communities. And what they found, the FDIC does a study of this every five years, is that MDIs, as they're called, minority depository institutions, do a better job of serving their community than the national banks. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the national banks, only two percent of their lending goes to minority uh, minorities. Two percent. Mm -hmm you know, and compared to over 60% of the MDIs. So we're lending to black people, you know, Hispanic or Latino banks are lending to Latino, same thing for Asian. So we do a better job of serving our community than the national banks do. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, one of the reasons that it's important. The other reason is that there, there is a need to have institutions that are able to speak truth to power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, you know, we have seen um, and it is why we're really uh, partnering with a lot of organizations, you know, whether that's Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. or, um, you know, promoting the, 16, the New York Times 1619 project by uh, Nicole Hannah Jones, is that we see the data. We see what's happening in our community. And what we want to do is to use our voice as a as a financial institution to both advocate and validate that voice. Mm -hmm. So we've been supporting Black Lives Matter now since its existence. Mm -hmm. You know, even when other organizations were, you know, thinking it was a terrorist group, we knew mm -hmm. that what they were saying and mm -hmm. that the need for criminal justice reform uh, was necessary and was also impacting our pocketbook. So you really need institutions that are willing to stand up and and not be um, uh, ha not have their voice be uh, diluted, for lack of a better term, um, by the desire to make people feel comfortable. Right. So that that really is why it's important. So we can say, you know, whether that's to the government or the regulators. Well, that's to the world that Black lives do matter, that Black money matters, 
and that we need to both uh, focus on social justice, criminal justice reform, systemic racism, as well as do the things that we need to do in our community to build wealth. So is it important for us to, so based on what you're saying, it definitely is important for us to, to in some way grow the amount of MDIs just in total mm -hmm. yep. uh, that exist. Yep. Um, is that, is it more about growth or is it more about creating new and adding to the, to the ecosystem or growing what we have? What's the fastest route and what's the um, smartest route? Yeah, well, it's either, either both. I, I shouldn't say either, it's both, really. It is growing what we have, it's adding new, you know, it's it's all of the above, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, the reality is even though we're 700 million, uh, the largest uh, Latino bank is 20 billion. The oh, largest wow. Asian American bank is 30 billion. Mm -hmm. So um, we as a community need to start to uh, trust each other. You know, I always use this phrase when we when we were growing up. Um, so it's a little, I'm a little older than you. <laughs> um, that yeah. we used to hear this phrase, their ice is colder. Okay. And it really wasn't, you know, very effective. Uh, they have been, the world has been very effective and getting us to not trust each other and to believe that if it's white owned, it's better. Mm -hmm. And so once um, integration happened, as opposed to continuing to build our businesses, we flocked to their businesses. Mm -hmm. And in some cases um, received uh, disrespectful service, um, but yet felt that we had arrived because we could now you know, open up an account in their bank or or even go to their school, you know, or all of the things that um, that we did in order to sort of move to the next level. And what we are now doing and it, and it's wonderful to see is to recognize that we actually have institutions, whether that's HBCUs, whether that's black banks, you know, we have institutions that are actually serve us better. Uh, mm -hmm. than their institutions and that their ice is not colder. Mm -hmm. You know, with One United, you can, you know, you can not only shop anywhere you want to be, you can bank at 100,000 locations nationwide. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, I think that what we're starting to see is that, hmm, you know, we may have been duped by this whole concept of their ice is colder and we need to bring our dollars home. But is the, uh, is the, answer more about and i do agree fully that we need to figure mm -hmm. out how to make um support 365 days i've got a hashtag black business 365 mm -hmm. uh, that i lean on from my sorority but um is it only about i don't want to say the word segregation or more about trying to find ways to make our businesses our banks as mainstream mm -hmm. as mainstream, that you're on as many corners as Bank of America <laughs> and everybody's utilizing your services because you bring that same kind of care. Mm -hmm. So um, that th that is to some degree a myth. Um, and what I mean by that is there's so many ways in which uh, national banks have taken advantage of us through our entire existence on this, you know, in this country, you know, from uh, financing slaves um, mm -hmm. that allowed them to use us as just like you got a mortgage on a home, mm -hmm. get a mortgage mm -hmm. on a slave, mm -hmm. uh, and an enslaved person, I should say, um, to discriminating against us and in, in mortgages and redlining, um, to even today, there are predatory practices, you know. Mm -hmm. which heard of you know we have one bank that's just been opening accounts you know without our permission you know mm -hmm. there are banks that have foreclosed on us even though they weren't entitled to mm -hmm. so there's so many ways that uh, financial institutions can take advantage of our community mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter that they're on every corner and you know what i mean that we really do have to uh, start to say that we're going to respect ourselves and we are going to uh, move our money 
um, to Black-owned institutions, and we are going to uh, help ourselves figure out how to build wealth. Because a lot of the things that we're taught about money are myths. They're not true. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't spend too much. We, we do know how to manage our money. <laughs> you know, we, there are some things that we need to do. You know, we have this, this thought that everybody needs to focus on the one transaction that will close the wealth gap for, for, for your family. The one transaction, you right. know, that could be a will, that could be insurance, that could be buying a home, right. that could be having a profitable business, you know, but there's one transaction that's gonna make the difference in terms of uh, generational wealth for your family. And we need people to tell us that and tell us how to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that they're telling us. You know, they're just telling us, hey, we're on every corner. And so that's that's really a change of mindset that we really need to understand. Um, and I, you know, I, I really can't emphasize it enough. And I and I think it is, you know, sort of my, you know, my role on this planet is to to make it clear and to speak not just truth to power, but truth to our community. Is the reality is that the financial service industry has not been our friend mm -hmm. and that we need to hold them accountable and we need to figure out ways to close the wealth gap, to focus on public policy, to vote, <laughs> because it, it, it has been public policy that has gotten in the way of us building wealth. Like we were actually Absolutely. excluded from building wealth. Absolutely. That's why we don't have money, not for anything <laughs> that we did, not because we didn't know how to spend and we're irresponsible. It's because public policy stopped us from That's building true. wealth. So we need to vote. And we stole some of our wealth, by the way. And so, absolutely. And so stole. Wealth. Their wealth was built on our back. On our exactly. Back. Exactly. Um, so, exactly. So, so yes. So we, we need to understand that voting is key. But secondarily, because public policy takes a long time, you know, to change and to address wrongs, we also need to do for ourselves. And that's the piece that, you know, we need to focus on is, again, it's not that cup of coffee. Like, don't say, OK, I got, can't buy that cup of coffee. OK, it's not that. OK, yeah. but you need to focus on the one transaction. It could be insurance for your parents. I don't know how many people, you know, only According to Forbes, only 28% of us have a will. And I always say, 100% of us are going to die. Right. So that, uh, so that other 72% like, needs, to, needs to have a will. You know, and then you hear about all these, you hear Aretha Franklin and Prince, you know, Chad Boswick. You hear all these people that knew they were going to die, or at least knew they had a lot of resources and didn't have a will. You know, so... I mean, it's like we, we need to have a will, you know, we need that's to have a savings. We need to have these things. But that's so if I'm thinking about. So you talk about gener generational wealth building and, and you're right. Those are conversations I'm having with my friends now. What does that mean? Yeah. And and what are the things that we know we should have, but we're not willing to invest in? Like you said, to have a will means you've got to pay for that. But there's a benefit to that. So how do we get past that conversation and what are the strategies a bank really needs to be able to say, it's time for us to, to, to take that leap. Right. So, so let me just say, we are taking that leap and, and your show is an example, right? Okay. <laughs> so, right? We try, we try. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I mean, your show didn't exist. I mean, we weren't talking about business. We weren't talking about money, you know? I mean, we were talking about civil rights and our freedom and our right to vote and, you know, all important things. Uh, but we weren't talking about our money. So the reality is that it is changing and that we are, you know, I mean, in fact, we're changing at the speed of light. You know, I look up, you know, we, we used to say, you know, in fact, I, I just thinking about five years ago, it's probably more than, maybe it's a little over five years ago, when we made the decision that we were going to speak in our authentic voice as a bank and be unapologetically black, mm -hmm. I remember that there were a lot. There was a lot of pushback on that. That people were like, mm, "I don't know if you should do that." <laughs> you know, like, mm, you know, know, white people aren't gonna bank with you. Black people ain't gonna bank with you. You know, <laughs> this isn't gonna end well. You know, <laughs> like, um, a little scary. <laughs> yeah, a little scary. You know, and even today, there are a lot of Black-owned businesses that are afraid to say that they're Black-owned. 
Uh -huh. You know, because they feel like white people aren't going to do business with them. Black people aren't going to do business with them. And yet that is changing, that people are actually seeking us out. <laughs> you know, that people are like, hey, I want to do business with a black owned institution. You know, you look around and you're like, oh, I didn't even know that was black owned, you know. So so um, so it is it is changing and it's changing very, very quickly. And I I'm very, very hopeful, optimistic. I, I mean, in fact, I know that this this transition is happening. I mean, it's one of the things that's scaring the other side, you know, because right. they realize like, oh, shoot, you know. A lot of assets. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that, you know, that we're here, we've arrived and and we know how to run a business and we know how to build wealth mm -hmm. and we're now going to hold you accountable. So I I know it, 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 it's happening now and I know it's going to be successful. Now, when you think of our history, you tapped on it a little bit. We've historically had policies that have interfered with our ability to have wealth. Uh, we've had things stolen from us. Um, a bank in general has historically been sort of at the front line of everything great and also at the front line of everything every time something fall, falls apart. Uh, the pandemic, it's out of your control. The stock market fall, crashes. The stock market dips. Uh, the housing boom fails in 2008. So you've got to be as a bank always on your P's and Q's and have an emergency plan like no other. Um, can you talk to small businesses about the importance of the emergency plan? What yeah. type of emergency plan you have in place and what's your, what's your pivot plan strategy like? So it is important to uh, to think ahead and to recognize that not only is knowledge power, but when you get the knowledge, uh, makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, think about if we knew, you know, last year this time that there was going to be a pandemic in 2020. You know, think about how better we would have been prepared for that, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just hitting us. You know, in some cases, it didn't hit people until like. April or May, as opposed to even January or December, or even November when it hit China. So part of this is, is recognizing that you do need to tune into shows like this, that you do need to, um, to keep up on the news, that you do need to sort of, you know, look at signs of things that are to come. So we uh, launched our digital bank in 2010. Okay. So we've been doing this for 14 years. And I can tell you we have the scars, you know, to show <laughs> for it uh, because it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, but we've gotten very, very good at it uh, because we've been doing it for 14 years. Mm -hmm. um, so the key is not just think looking at today. So I'm just I want to be more direct. So not when you when you pivot, you need to pivot not just for today, but for the future. Right. You know, you need to think about what you're doing and how it's going to grow over time. Mm -hmm. So for us, again, you know, sort of uh, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, when we launched the digital bank, we thought that the next generation was going to not walk into our branch, but want to be able to do everything, you know, using their phone. Mm -hmm. And um we, you know, we launched launched our mobile app, and we spent a lot of time perfecting it so that it could serve the needs of our community. Now, what happened with the pandemic is that generational change that we expected happened overnight. Right. Like we, we had right. older people coming in saying, you know, how do I access the bank? You know, from my phone. You know, you know, 78, 80 year old people coming in here with their phones, you know, saying, how do I get, you know, because I don't want to come in here with this pandemic, you know, which was wonderful to see. But um, but for us, that journey had excited, had happened 14, 15 years ago, that that pivot. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, what what also was a pivot uh, for us was just the whole social distancing. You know, we had started. Um, some renovations on, in fact, our office here in Miami, um, you know, two years ago. And thankfully we had, because, you know, we have a big enough office to expand. We've gone from, you know, a small number of staff members here in Miami to, you know, we're, we're up to, I think over 30 or 40 
uh, people in this building. And we're able to do that because we have been able, we had the, the space and the, the construction was already um, uh, happening. Um, you know, we also, in terms of knowledge, we had the benefit of being in Boston where the pandemic really, uh, the virus really hit um, mm. initially. And we saw what was happening in Boston. We're able to prepare ourselves in Miami and LA, our offices, you know, and got sanitizer before, you know, they ran out and, and masks and all that kind of stuff. We were able to get that really quickly mm -hmm. because we knew before a lot of other people that this was coming. So I, I'd say one is try to figure out not what's happening today, but what's going to happen tomorrow. And, mm -hmm. you know, a, internet, you know, digital has to be part of your strategy. You know, mm -hmm. that that is uh, essential because whether it's this pandemic or the next, you know, the world has changed, mm -hmm. I agree. you know, forever. Um, so that that's an example of one. Um, but there are other things that I think are important for, uh, for us to all look at. Um, what also is becoming important to people is your values as an institution. You know, I say to people, you can't, you can't say you're for the black community today and then not treat your black employees or any of your employees well. You know, you can't, you, you have to be authentic and you have to have the same uh, values, you know, to the outside world that you have inside. So, you know, thinking about ways to reward your your employees or thinking about ways to collaborate. Also, this is the other thing that's happened is that it's very hard to create something that is unique, you right. know, because of the internet, people just look at it and copy it. You know? and stuff. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so you really have to, you know, really collaborate with a lot of people to come up with things that uh, not just are unique, but are things that only you can offer. Okay. okay. You know, and so, and, and that takes, you know, that takes time. And, and also oh. identifying niches, you know, people right. say there's riches and niches, you know, sort of identifying niches. Uh, you know, I don't know if you know the story of Wayfair, um, but Wayfair started basically identified um, people that were selling specific things mm -hmm. that were that were real niches, you know, like if you wanted a, a guitar that looked like a, I don't know, a battleship or something like that, you know, they were identifying all these people that were selling really unique things and they gave them a platform to sell it. And then they turned that platform into Wayfair. But Wayfair is really you know, they don't have a lot of inventory. You know, they're really just connecting people that offer unique, you know, unique products and services. And so really the idea is, you know, what what are the niches out there that, and I, and I you know, I look around and I see them everywhere. Like, right. I don't know why someone hasn't, you know, we, we play spades or bid whist. You know, that seems like a niche that somebody right. should be tapping into. You know, we should own barbecue. I mean, that should be right. a niche, you know? I mean, there are all these things that are part of our community. You know, bean pie, know. bean pie. Like, okay, I love bean pie. Like how can somebody has it, you know? I go to this this website, uh, Gold Belly, which is a, you know, pretty big website for selling food. Mm -hmm. And I go to Gold Belly and they sell like the best food all over the country. But I, you know, type in soul food to see, okay, what black, you know, restaurants or caterers are part of this gold belly. And like what came up was a a restaurant in San Francisco that was not black owned. And I'm just like, how could this be? The only rest black restaurant I found on Gold Belly was Red Rooster, which oh, is, really? you know, great. Yeah, yeah. Red Rooster is a great restaurant. But I'm just like, you know, we we we, we have we, yes, look we, into that because that they they provide a platform for people for restaurants to basically sell their food across the country. So but I'm just like, there are a lot of niches. 
Mm. I think this is a challenge though. Um, and I think you and I talked a little bit earlier about mindset, how we change the mindset. Um, I have found in my space, and I am a small business owner, mm-hmm. um, that there's a lot of support of what I call the hustle versus business and the hustle is making some barbecue in your backyard and selling a couple of some sandwiches at the end of the day you are running a business you are literally running a business right we need to formulate we need to you know become an lsc we need to understand there's a platforms out there that that will help you open up to a larger market though that's where our miss seems to be is the difference between the hustle and and the business how do we how do we jump that hurdle? Right. How do you know you're ready? <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's a, a very good point. And I, I do see that all the time. And um, part of it is we have these great ideas, but we don't have uh, always the back office. Uh, I call it the back office uh, support and structure that we need. Mm-hmm. And that includes, right, are we uh, incorporated the mm-hmm. right way? You know, a lot of people will have a corporation, but they'll be the only employee of their corporation like that doesn't make any sense you know you should have had you should be an s corp or uh a um have an llc as opposed to uh, a corporation or people will um you know not pay themselves you know and so or not pay or pay their their employees in cash you know and right. you know as opposed to using a, a payroll service i mean so and and paying you know people try to, you know, not pay their taxes. So there are a lot of ways in which we do have to get better at the back office. Um, but I also think that 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 too will come. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It is, uh, and, and, I, and I also feel as though we have to work together on that. You know, mm-hmm. um, there are a lot of organizations that offer technical assistance to businesses to help them, you know, with that structuring. Um, You know, I I remember speaking to a young lady who owned a hair salon and when the uh, uh, Paycheck Protection Program uh, came about, she was able to get a loan because she said two years ago, she had decided that she was gonna focus on her structure. Right. And so she had put all the pieces in place. So when this program happened, she was able to get, you know, alone because she had done all of those things. So um, it does pay off in the end. It allows you to grow, um, but it is something that does require some help. You know, whether it's an accountant or an attorney. You know, that it's not something that uh, most people, black or white, know uh, anything about. Um, right. You know, licensing, all of those things. Um, building a website, even a name, you know, I, you know, we are, we, you know, want to talk about like, do you own, do you own you, (laughs) you know, do you own you, you know, a lot of people will come up with these great names, but it's like somebody else owns it, you know, (laughs) so you spend all this time, you know, uh, building up your name and you turn around, you know, and somebody else owns it, you know, (laughs) Um, or there's times when, People have this great name and it will be available, but they didn't, but you know, they don't know to like, okay, you need to, first of all, you need to get the URL, mm-hmm. you know, you need to file it, you know, a trademark. Um, so it's like all of these things that, that will come to us, but that you're right. They, they do tend to, and I, they, they do tend to get in our way. And I'll also say that we also need to think big right now. We tend to think small. I agree. So I, I do think we think about selling barbecue out of our backyard as opposed to, and that's why I was using Gold Belly, because that's a platform where you could sell, you know, nationwide, you right. know, not just out of your backyard, right. not just to your neighbors and your friends, but you can actually put a, you know, do something on a national basis. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, and, and I know that we will take advantage of those, but we, we, we do need a nudge. You know, we need an option. Yeah. Um, so you talk about the PPP loan. Um, I have to say with the PPP loan, the community bank, the local small bank was the hero for mm-hmm. sure. 
work. Yeah. Um, hands down, a lot of people, and I spoke to several people myself who would not, but for a small bank, had all their ducks in a row, but, but for a small bank of some kind would not have been able to benefit from that at all. Yeah. So, um, you know, what does that say about banking and, and how how our community, were you, first of all, were you one of the, the lenders? Uh, and what does that say about how we really need to start to implement more of a community-based connection when it comes to that bank, that banking institution? Mm -hmm. So yes, we were uh, one of the banks. Um, we actually um, offered it in the second round because we, just as we had suspected, the first round, the big, the big banks just took all the money. It was gone in like a week and they gave yeah. it to their big, you know, their big mm -hmm. uh, customers. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, you know, we saw a lot of people in our community, a lot of businesses were not getting funding. And we said, we just got to, you know, we got to do this. Um, and we were surprised at how many companies uh, that came to us for the loan. Um, when we when we gave our approval to the SBA, we were told that they had already been approved somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't that they didn't qualify, but that they just didn't get the funding in the first round. And then once we told them, they were able to go to the bigger, you know, the big banks where they had put their first application in. And they're like, oh, oh, yeah, you are approved, <laughs> you know, Um so we didn't care, I mean, that we didn't do it. I mean, we were just happy that they were able to get funding. Right. But we do wonder if we hadn't told them, hey, you're approved somewhere, you know, whether or not they, the, the larger banks would ever told them. I don't know. Um, but it does speak to the importance of, of community banks, you know, of Black-owned banks, of, of MDIs, um, and... Uh, it does also speak to the need for our community to understand that we may think of ourselves as being an important customer to these large banks, mm -hmm. but in the end, you know, it it, it is uh, banking. You know, how do I describe it? Banking is goes to where the money is, right, <laughs> you right. know, um, unless there is another mission that a bank has, if it's just pure profit, which it is uh, for the larger national banks, they're publicly mm -hmm. traded. They got to, you know, they got to focus on their bottom line first. Mm -hmm. And if it's pure profit, they're going to go and do the billion dollar transaction as opposed to the million dollar transaction. Right. And um, there are a lot of black businesses that were surprised that they weren't better served by their banks because they had been banking with them for like 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And they were surprised when they went in for PPP that the banks in some cases didn't even know who they were. Right. You know? <laughs> at least I can put my money here in a long time. Can't yeah. The local yeah. Brand manager at least know who I am. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So you wrote a children's book called I Got Bank. Yeah. Yeah. What my granddad taught me about money. What did yeah. your granddad teach you about money mm -hmm. or the person who was your mentor yeah. when it came to finances? Yeah. So, um, I, I did write about Jazz Ellington and his granddad, um, but for me, it actually was my great grandmother okay. um, who taught me. Um, and she, her name was uh, Annie Coachman. Um, we called her Ma Honey. Um, she owned a barbecue pit, oh, nice. a, a candy store, a penny candy store, a juke joint, <laughs> and some and some houses. So she was and, a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, she was. And I but I didn't realize this until, you know, maybe five years ago, which wow, is awesome. really, yeah. Nice. Um so um and I, I, I tell this story because it's really important for for young folks, for, for you all to really um think about how you became who you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we give credit to, like in my case, I'm just going to speak for myself. You know, people have asked me, well, how did you get to be owner, president of a bank? And I'd say, 
you know, I went to Harvard Business School and I went to Brown University, majored in economics, and I worked at Bank of America and American Express, and, and I would have gone through my resume. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But what I realized, um, really because an artist had pushed me to like, you know, well, really? Like, is that, you know, <laughs> is that how you became who you are? They you know, really pushed them. me to think about it. And I was like, you know, it was my great grandmother. And mm -hmm. I used to follow her around. I used to work in the penny store. I used to sell these knee high sodas. I, you know, I remember all that candy. You know, as a kid, <laughs> I used to sell. The time um, is good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, you know, and I realized that she was a businesswoman before, you know, sort of the, the term businesswoman was coined. I mean, mm -hmm. she was an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. The and um, and then when I started talking about her, like all because I, you know, this is Indian Town, Florida. For those of you, it's in Martin County, you know, going towards Bell Glade, Pahokee, little small town, railroad track. White people lives on one side, black people lives on the other. And but when I, you know, when I talk to my friends from Indian Town, they talk about how much she influenced them as well, mm. and how she was just an amazing. Uh, woman. Um, and so, um, so what, what was the point? So, <laughs> oh, the book, the book, the book. so I wrote it about a boy and his granddad. Um, but for me, it was really my great grandmother that, that taught me about money. Okay. And I do think for all of us, it is someone, you know, somewhere in our life that planted the seeds for us to be who we are. And we need to give credit and homage and respect to, to those ancestors um, because it wasn't you know, sort of the last leg of our journey. It was really the, the first leg mm -hmm. of our journey and what we, what we saw growing up that really influenced who we are today. And as an expert today and in the financial institution, would you Think about what your great grandmother did. Would you have given her a loan? Would you have invested in her and her business? Yeah, that's a that's a good question as well. Um, so what I I know is that she paid cash for everything. Okay. And it did not occur to me why. Didn't occur to me why that right. she couldn't get a loan. Right. That right. She <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know. That's what I'm saying. I'm not like. Okay, she had all these right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. 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 And and I think that sort of gets in the way of us thinking about our history. You right. know, when you think about the things that we've had to overcome to get to where we are today, you know, it's very easy today to look back and say, "Oh, well, why didn't they do that? Or why didn't they do this?" But when you realize what we had to overcome. So let's talk about today. Yeah, so we, at, at, from a banking perspective, we give loans that are real estate secured. We put people in homes, we, we support multifamily property, and we promote, uh, promote and, and lend to commercial real estate. Okay. Um, but there are businesses out there that are looking for loans based on their business. Right. And for those loans, we actually partner with institutions to provide and organizations to provide those loans. Okay. Because we do recognize that it's not our expertise, but there are people that not only are experts at it in terms of doing the lending, but they're also experts at helping businesses with the technical assistance, the things that we talked about, to make sure that they're correctly incorporated, that they, you know, that they own themselves, you know. Right. And so we partner with these organizations to ensure that our community can get the business loans. And, and what I will say is that cap, you know, as difficult as it is to get to raise capital, there are some sweet spots. There are some organizations that are doing outstanding work that um, and that have funds available for black for black owned business. That's great. That's great. So before we go, we want to make sure um, we ask you how we can get in touch with you and also share with us how we can get access to the book. Yes. Yeah. So first of all, you can get in touch with the bank at one united, O N E united.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. 
Um, in terms of myself, I am um, easily available. Actually, <laughs> you can um, you can uh, get to me through LinkedIn. Um, that's probably a good place if you want to send me a message. Um, you know, there's also just calling the bank and, you know, and asking for me. So I'm very easy. I'm, I'm accessible. Um, mm -hmm. Or you can email me at twilliams at oneunited.com. Um, let's see. What did you also, the book. Oh, the, the book. book is available yeah. at Amazon. Um, again, it's I Got Bank. Um, every year we have a financial literacy uh, essay contest for youth. And this year we made the book available for free that you could have just downloaded it. Uh, the okay. contest is over, but we will do a similar contest next year. We don't expect um, COVID to be over next year. So we, we, do, we will offer it, um, you know, to be able to download it for free for people that are homeschooling their kids or, you know, wow. to, just to give uh, that support. And then I guess the last uh, thing I would say is to, to your to your audience is to you know definitely check out our website mm -hmm. you know and really focus on the one transaction that can close the wealth gap uh, for you and your family um, you know we have a lot of great blog articles on the topic and mm -hmm. and we really hope that you know all of us um, you know 100% of us focus on that one transaction for our family. That's actually a very good strategy now that I'm really sitting and thinking about it. That's a very mm -hmm. good strategy of which to really start that that process for sure. And I hope we are all hearing what she has to say yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you again so much for taking yeah, this. Thank you. This is so wonderful. Um, I tried to, you know, probe and get a little information about yeah. finances that we can share yeah. with the audience and yeah. we hope we can connect with you again in the future um yeah. I, I am highly impressed with the book as well so yeah thank you. Uh, so thank you again yeah thank you thank you have a great day so everyone thank you for joining us again today i told you this was going to be a good show um because anything that has to do with a with you know wealth building money how we can support uh wealth building in my community the african american community and beyond actually um I, you know i'm always a fan of so thank you for tuning in we will be back here again on thursday at 10 a.m we i'm actually kind of excited about that show too uh we will be talking to the president of mars brown um dr kevin james he is going to talk to us about the historical black college and university mars brown um, and what it takes really to keep an hbcu um running and existing and the importance of that particular institution in our ecosystem. Um, we're, we're really excited about that. I'm very excited about it anyway. Uh, so we hope you'll tune in. Uh, that's 10 o'clock on Thursday and talk to you soon. Have a great day, everyone.